Uh, hello and welcome to the virtual tour of intentional communities. We are here for another month of learning from all of the different intentional communities in our network. Welcome, welcome to the folks who are coming in on Zoom. Welcome to everyone who's watching on the Facebook live stream or on YouTube. And of course, big welcome and gratitude to all of our wonderful presenters with us here today. All right, so my name is Cynthia and I'm gonna be the host for today's event. I am calling from Vermont where I live in a small intentional community. And uh, this event is hosted through the Foundation for Intentional Community and now also in partnership with my organization called Community Finders. Uh, so if you are here as part of the Meet the Community session through one of our Finder Circle programs, uh, welcome to you. You've made it to the right place. And I'll be talking more about that partnership shortly. Great. So we're going to start by hearing from Beacon Hill Friends House and then Always Community and then Bruderhof Communities. So we're going to start with Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer. You're, oh, you're in Boston. I actually I grew up just north of Boston, so in, in Lynn. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, so maybe cool. I'll, when I <laughs> come back down to see family, I could stop in and visit your community. Thank Please you for being do. here. Yeah. yeah, of course. Excited to, to be here with you and with all of you. For those who are saying they're here from the Bay Area, I grew up in Livermore, California, so not very far from um, San Jose, where some of you are from. But hello all, my name is Jennifer Newman. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the executive director of Beacon Hill Friends House, which is the intentional community in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. Um, so we are a Quaker center and intentional community based in downtown Boston, literally the Boston Commons, like two streets from me over there. Um, and we are a Quaker center in that we are founded um, by friends and I am a Quaker and our executive leadership is typically Quaker, um, but our residents do not have to be Quaker to be here. So it's part of the Quakerism is rooted in um, spiritual exploration, part of a movement of people founded in, in Christianity, but to be seekers who are exploring what they believe. And so often folks who come here um, come from a variety of different religious and non-religious traditions, but who all share a desire to talk about spirituality as a part of their life um, and explore what that means for them. This is a picture of our residents from last fall. Um, I'll move on. So we, um, we are founded on Massachusetts land. So that's the, the native lands that we sit on. Um, and we were, uh, we are in a building that was built in 1805. So we're in a historic neighborhood in Boston. Um, it was created as two neighboring brick row houses that were combined in 1920 by a family who then bought out both sides. Um, I'm actually in one of those rooms in our office now and behind me is our meeting room, which is a large ballroom space that was converted into a ballroom in 1920 by the family that owned this home. So they owned it privately um, and their son, John Green inherited the home um, and donated it um, to become a Quaker center for learning um, for community living and learning in 1957. This picture on the right here is a residence in the 80s, although it's black and white, so it looks like, oh, what era is that? Um, it's not actually that old of a picture. Um, so our mission here at the Friends House is to embody the Quaker principles of faith, simplicity, integrity, community, and social responsibility in order to nurture and to call forth the light in all of us. We're not necessarily trying to make, we're not really trying to make people become Quakers, but to explore through Quaker principles and practices, so contemplative, um, practices are a big part of Quakerism um, to understand the, the light in them or what their own understanding of spirituality is and their gifts and how their gifts align with what they are called to do in the world. Um, and we have folks from a lot of different, a lot of different kinds of backgrounds and I'll explain that a little later too. It's about our space. We are a large building. Um, so we have 18 bedrooms, seven and a half bathrooms, a large meeting room that we call a meeting room. It's a ballroom. Um, it has 18 foot ceilings um, and uh, it's about 40 feet long. Um, we have a parlor and a music room with a beautiful Steinway grand piano. We have a library that's quite large um, and a dining room, two courtyards. Um, and we have 14,000 square feet here. 
in Boston. Um, the picture here is of residents in what we call our St. Francis courtyard. Um, St. Francis is um, not part of the Quaker religious tradition, but beloved and is a statue that was left behind in the courtyard um, that it is so named. And so this is about half the size of what the, the courtyard is in this picture. So here's some more examples of our space itself. So that's the, the front of our space is the upper left corner. Um, our dining room is in the upper right corner. The meeting room is in the lower right corner. One of our guest rooms that's the size of a large single resident room is in the bottom middle. Um, and the fall with the Virginia creeper on, in our St. Francis courtyard um, is in the left corner. I'll give you a moment to, to look at that for a moment. Yeah, it's beautiful. And I'm, I'm just imagining the days when families would have ballrooms in their house and use them for balls. Amazing. Yeah, yeah, privately. Yeah, um, right. And now we do have, right now we have um, an improv fusion dance group who's using that space as a ballroom. Um, every first and third Saturday in Boston. And so we allow community groups to, to use our space in the um, rent on a sliding scale so that our space, which is huge, can be used and useful in the world. Um, bring to, here's some of the members of our team. If you um, encountered us on the internet, like applying for residency, I'm the executive director. My colleague Vicki is our associate director. My colleague Ben manages our facility. So our programs, what you really may be more interested in. Um, so residency, we've been, we were founded to be a community residence since 1957, where approximately 20 adults can stay for up to four years. So this isn't somebody's permanent living situation. We are meant to be an experience in living an intentional community. And so we have lots of um, systems and practices and conflict mediation trainings and, and things that we do to help folks live with 20 intergenerational adults. Um, and it's a very intense, we call it sometimes an experiment in living communally to think about, is this something that you want to bring into your own life? And if so, how? And we've had a lot of folks who've lived here who've moved into other intentional communities or who have started their own. And we consider that a huge success of our residency program. Um, so yeah, it's a, we live according to those Quaker values, faith, simplicity, integrity, community, and social responsibility. Um, but most of our residents are not Quakers, which is very interesting. Um, so folks get to explore what that, what the Quakerism religious tradition has to offer. Um, we also consider this to be more than just a place to live. So we talk about this as a place to grow and to deepen. So it is an experience of internal seeking and transformation. Um, but it, that what that looks like depends on who you are and what you're interested in exploring. Um, we are also a place that hosts public programs and events. This photo is from our endowed lecture named after um, two of our longtime directors. Um, there's about 30 people in the meeting room during this lecture and about 100 people on Zoom. Um, we host, this one was on um, Kingian nonviolence. Um, we host all kinds of programming that work to cultivate community, nurture spiritual deepening and empower collective action. And that ranges from lectures, workshops, documentary screenings, that sort of thing that's run by our staff and volunteers. Um, we also have a hospitality program that houses, we have two guest rooms in our space that allow folks to, to stay in community very briefly in downtown Boston. Um, and we also allow community groups to use our space who are mission aligned. Um, so those are the programs that we run as an organization. If you are interested in becoming a resident, this is residents on house retreat where we made um, small planets that were each our own representative of our, where we were at in that time. And then we created a solar system through stringing them on fishing line and hanging them up <laughs> um, with like old lights that someone had found on the street. In our neighborhood, people give away a lot of things for free. Um, so anyways, that's what that picture is, but how to become a resident, there is an application on our website, it's bhfh.org. Um, and what happens is you apply to residency and Vicki, our associate director will reach out to you, say we got your application and we send that on to a committee of residents and staff, um, our residency committee who reviews applications and sits down with folks for interviews. We do do interviews remotely. So we've always used Zoom um, for remote candidates for interviews. 
um, and on site if you're available, and then you're welcome to come to us for dinner. Um, and we have folks move here from all over the country and the world um, historically. So if you're interested in learning more about Beacon Hill Friends House, you can learn more on our website. Here's another picture of residents at that fall house retreat last year. Um, and we do have residency openings on sort of rolling basis. We don't have a particular application deadline. We accept applications and sometimes interview folks um, ahead of when we might have an opening coming up. Um, and so you might get accepted for residency and then move in several months later. That's what happened for me um, when I moved in as a resident. So with that, I'll stop my presentation, but I'm happy to answer any more questions folks have. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Really, really appreciate that beautiful presentation. Nicely done. And I love all the <laughs> colorful photos of the community and the art <laughs> projects you do. That's, that's great. And we do have some questions for you. Um, all right, so let me see here. Um, well, some of them have to do with the timing. So mm -hmm. is there actually a limit to stay for only four years? And yes. does that also, so yes. And does that apply to staff like yourself? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So staff leave here as long as we are on staff. Um, and residents can really only live here for up to four years. We ask that folks sign, um, we don't sign like leases here, but we sign residency agreements. So folks are on like a month to month situation. But in that agreement, we have an understanding there that you can only live here for up to four years because that's part of the mission of the organization. Um, yeah, and then staff can live here for as long as we are on staff. Okay, okay, that makes sense. And if somebody were to apply, is it a long wait period before they might be accepted? Like, do you have openings now or upcoming? Yeah, so the the wait period for admittance, it really varies. So we had someone apply for residency on um, Friday and wanted to move in as soon as possible and is moving in today. So um, that turnaround time is very fast. Sometimes we're able to make that work when we have an existing opening and the stars align. Um, other times there's not like a specific wait period that we ever have. It's just like, do we have a room available? Do we know when that person's moving out? And can we make it work with the timeline that you have? Um, and then do we have openings now? We do, we are in an interview process. In Boston, leasing is um, on a, a cycle of really like September 1st. And then some June 1st, some January 1st. And so with that, we get a lot of folks coming in. That's like our most competitive, if there is one, not trying to be competitive, but application cycle. And so right now we have a lot of applications here and that doesn't mean we can't accept more, um, but it just means that that's where we are. But we do know that we'll have some openings in the winter um, and then come upcoming in the next spring and summer. And then sometimes we have move outs that we're not expecting. Um, and so the, I anticipate that we'll have like two-ish openings over the next, um, additional openings over the next maybe six to nine months, um, and then more probably next fall. Okay. Okay. So would it be advisable if somebody is considering it to reach out now, even if they're not planning to move in the near future? Yeah, it's always, we, we often have, um, folks come even for house dinner. So we have house dinner every Sunday through Thursday at 6.30 p.m. Um, if you're in the area and would like to come to house dinner, you need to let us know that, but the um, you can email us at um, info at bhfh.org, which I also just put in a chat for everyone. Um, we have folks come and say, hey, I'm interested in living here and then might live here like years down the road. And so we're cultivating a relationship so that you kind of know what you're getting into and that we, um, yeah, we can meet you is really great. Um, do we want yeah. to do another question too? Uh, yeah, yeah, there's a few more. Um, if somebody wanted to leave before the four years is, is oh, up? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> very much. Okay. We ask that people stay here for at least a year, but sometimes um, those living arrangements are shorter. Sometimes too, because of that, I said like June 1st, September 1st, leasing cycle in the area, folks might move out for a June 1st lease, but we might not have people moving in until September. And in that period of time, we sometimes do, we call them like mini residencies or like personal retreats, like a short term. It really depends on what you're wanting to get out of that. And that we don't offer as a, um, a an advertised um, 
type of residency on our residency page, but it is something that we'll be in conversation with folks about. So if you are interested in staying here for like a three month summer period, those tend to be available. Um, we had someone do that just for a month in July this summer. Nice. Um, yeah. Are most people students or, you know, what, what are, what kind of people tend to be attracted to this opportunity? Yeah, we have a lot of, so that's our house line. Um, <laughs> we have a lot of students who live here, but it's not all students. So historically we were students um, right when the organization was founded. Um, and right now we do have a critical mass of graduate students, about half of the house, but other folks, um, so we have some folks who have been retired or re recently retired or kind of semi-retired doing some part-time work. Um, we have some folks who have been professors. We have had some folks who um, work at, we've like, I had a couple of residents in my time who've been teachers at the public schools in the area. Um, I used to work for a different nonprofit doing communications when I lived here. Some folks work for the universities in the area. That's, those are like our biggest employers in Boston. Um, we've had some folks work in the, the seaport area in Boston has a lot of tech startups. And so we get some of those folks who come live here too. Um, really the common thread is, is not necessarily what people do for work, but that they want to be sort of living in community with other people and that Boston brought them here usually for work or for school. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, well, I have a question for you because you didn't mention it in your presentation, mm -hmm. but I'm really curious, how do you find this community and like, what is your, yeah, your experience, Ben? I know that you have a leadership role, but yeah, what was, what was that process like of discovering and deciding and, and joining the community? Yeah, that's a great question. So I've actually held sort of every kind of relationship to this organization that you can other than alumni of the house. Um, so I came and visited while I was in divinity school at Vanderbilt. Um, and I was coming to visit the area and a friend and the, the meeting and the Quaker congregation. Quakers out here call it a um, meeting for worship. So you might call it Quaker meeting. Um, and I was coming to visit the meeting and got a tour of the house, it's just like fell in love with what it could be and what it was as an institution. Um, that there were community groups that used the space. There was a Quaker congregation here and that 20 people lived in intentional community, um, but of different faith backgrounds. And I moved up here then after divinity school and didn't live here right away, but I joined the organization had a strategic plan kickoff that summer. Um, trying to expand its public programming and its partnerships with area organizations. And so I joined as a volunteer as part of that initiative and did, ended up serving on the board of the organization in my early 20s um, while I was working for a different one. Um, because I really cared about that mission, that social witness mission um, of being engaged in a local community involved in advocacy, but also um, being a space where folks can really grow and deepen in their spiritual, um, in their spiritual lives. And so I joined as a board member and then moved in that next May as a house resident um, and became a part of the community myself. And so I, I had interviewed, that's where like the leasing cycle got me there. There was an opening, but it wasn't quite when I needed to move to Boston. And so I just went with a different lease the first year that I lived here and then moved in um, later when it made sense for me. Um, and then I, the, as part of that strategic plan initiative, they'd opened up a program manager position who would help um, lead that, you know, strategic effort. And um, after someone else, my friend Emily held that role, um, I decided to, to take it on in 2020. And I've been on staff since yeah, January of 2020, where I thought I knew what I was getting into. And then a whole pandemic happened and my program manager role became a very different thing, but it was a really huge gift um, in my life. And um, I now serve as the executive director as of this last April. So I've had a very, um, wild ride with this organization, but I really deeply love this community. I especially love, um, in Divinity School, we call this concept multiplicity, but thinking about how do we share community um, and spiritual community with folks who believe differently than us. And I think that here is a place that we can really, because of Quakerism, and I am a, a Quaker, but um, because of the, the spiritual rooting that we have, we're really able to, to hold spirituality across difference. Um, and so I've lived with folks with very, very different spiritual backgrounds from my own. And we've gotten to have some really deep conversations about that and about the ways that we take action out of our values and what our values mean for how we make meaning in the world. Um, and so our community really is a place where we're able to do that on a daily level over coffee in small and big ways. 
Um, and that's one of the things that I love about it the most. Oh, great, great. Thank you so much, Jennifer, for sharing mm -hmm. with us. Uh, you know, I'm, I wrote down that word multiplicity. I think it, it shines through you and your passion for this and just congratulations on your evolution, uh, you know, with the organization and also professionally getting to do what you love. It's, it, it shows. Yeah. Oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you. It's so good to be here with all of you and thank you for listening. Yeah. Yeah. Great. All right, so now we are going to travel from Boston, Massachusetts, heading south to Georgia, and we have with us Angela and Lachelle of Always Intentional Community. Hello to you both and welcome. Really looking forward to learning about your community. Hello. Great, great. We're happy to be here. Thank you very much for inviting us. Yep. So we'll go ahead and uh, share, share our PowerPoint. So we're here to talk about the always intentional community in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And but then there we go. Yeah. Our, about us, the speakers, we were there at the very beginning of the talks when we were just beginning to dream about having this community exist. So I'm Lachelle Foley and I started AAP, we'll explain that, in 2005. <laughs> I'm currently the chief financial officer and I am also a member of the LLC. We'll also explain that. Yeah, so I'm Angela Warren. I joined around 2011. I am the CEO of AAP and also a member of the Always LLC. We will put this in the chat, but we have a website that will support uh, these, that give additional information if you are interested. First, uh, people might want to know who we are. We are Athens Area Pagans. We are a 501c3 religious organization. Our goal is service and advocacy for pagans of all paths in the Athens, Georgia area. The next question we usually get is, what is a pagan? So uh, for us, we figure that anyone who self-identifies as a pagan is a pagan. It's There is no one set definition. We'll joke if you ask 10 pagans what paganism is, you're going to get 20 answers. But for the most part, it is a uh, nature-based religion or spirituality. Uh, some pagans use path rather than religion, and the name always comes partly from this. The origin of the intentional community. Uh, so many pagans, uh, we prefer to practice in nature since we are basing our spirituality around nature, but a lot don't have good access to nature. We practice either alone or in small groups, so we have limited resources, and we also have realistic concerns about uh, discrimination, so we also like our privacy. Uh, let's see, the original goal was to provide uh, religious spaces, so we'd have church-like infrastructure for uh, natural areas for religious and spiritual use, which would include facilities and meeting spaces and also less, you know, religious things like trails and community gardens so we can still use the land outside of religious practice. The, the problem was we, we couldn't figure out how we were going to do it. We needed it to be economically sustainable, which meant we didn't want to just depend on whatever someone dropped in a donation box, right? And we wanted it to be easy to maintain. And that's where the intentional community was born. The idea is that the on-site residents, they would pay rents and they would do, give us labor and that would give us the basic economic stability, allow us to pay the taxes and the insurance. Also having people living on site is good for safety and security. There are always sympathetic people on site. They could also help with grounds upkeep as they could, and at least they would know what needs doing. In return, they would get affordable housing. One of our main goals is that this community would have affordable housing. Many of our members and lots of other people are not wealthy. Uh, we want people to be able to participate regardless of their economic status. And in Athens area, low income, uh, good housing is a need. Going to our current and status plan, uh, current status and plans, we have a short video. Uh -huh. Yeah, which we made for our Indiegogo campaign that we're going to launch soon. That'll help us kind of get off the ground a little bit more. And we're going to go ahead and show that. The video really explains a lot about where we are and where we're trying to be. Yeah, so we figured we'd let that speak for us on what we want to do. 
the whole time I've been on optimize for video and I did not mean to do that, but <laughs> right, oops. The always intentional community. We'll provide outdoor spaces for local pagans to use in their religious practices. These spaces will be available for use by all pagans of all paths. The land will be in town and easily accessible, even to persons without vehicles. It's on the bus route. To make these spaces economically sustainable, they will be supported by an on-site intentional community. By the way, you don't need to be a pagan to live there or to come out and enjoy the land. About a year ago, seven of us bought 48 acres shown here within the bold purple outline. We are developing plans that can grow as we do. This plan shows what we can do within the current zoning. But we want to provide a lot more healthy, sustainable, low-cost housing while keeping most of the land in its beautiful and natural state. In addition to the religious spaces, our plans include community gardens, a healthy local market, a horse rescue tended by wounded warriors, and a bed and breakfast for eco-minded travelers. We have been working hard to make the land usable. So far, we have a circle space cleared, and we have begun having services there. We also have a series of hiking trails that are available to anyone who would like some time in nature. But to do much more, we need an updated survey. The official public records are from 1916. We have a survey from 2008, but it isn't official. We need an updated official survey. With over two miles of property lines, a new survey will cost a lot. To reduce costs, we have been clearing the property lines, but no amount of clearing will make the survey cheap. Please help us pay for a survey. Thank you. Before going on, a special thanks to Josh Coons Environmental Design. They gave us the development plans for free. We've had, uh, we've been looking at community interest about this project for a while now. Uh, we've put out surveys asking what people would like to use the land for, and um, they'd like to use for public rituals. That's a very positive response. Uh, private rituals was a bit more mixed, but still pretty positive. Uh, like to use the land to acknowledge life events like birthdays, marriages, funerals, et cetera, um, pretty positive. People would like to see small and medium-sized clearings for the most part, but there also is also interest in large clearings. They really want open air structures. And also we're gonna have enclosed structures because it's Georgia, it's hot. Let's see, wanna do the challenges? Sure. There are also challenges. The primary challenge is resources. We are not wealthy and we are an all volunteer organization. We're also inside a city. That means there are many restrictions on building and the approval process can be lengthy and expensive. To make matters more complicated, we want an eco-village. And there are barriers to sustainable housing for ordinary buyers. At the commercial level, local contractors are often unfamiliar with the methods. The municipal level, zoning ordinances and building codes do not address the unfamiliar methods. And very importantly, at the financial level, lenders require comps, and there are none. Comps are other buildings that are like the building you want to build or purchase. So we can't get a loan to build the building unless there's already one in existence, but there aren't any in existence. So we're stuck a little. It's not nearby. <laughs> at least not nowhere near us. Yeah. Um, so we want to try to move things forward. We were Wondering, maybe our site could be an incubator. We could work with builders, governments, financiers, and grant agencies to build the unusual homes and have people from the community live there. We'll give tours, take measurements, make reports, get inspected, provide platforms for training of manufacturers. We hope this would help the governments make informed decisions and maybe put some comps on the market. So some organizational details about us. Uh, let's see, so we are governed by consensus. We are required by law to have a CEO, CFO, and secretary under our structure, so we have those. But otherwise, everyone has an equal voice. We are a religious organization, so we do not have a board of directors, but we do have a council of elders who have extra blocking power in case it is needed, and our bylaws are available to read online. 
The economic model that is currently in place, and it could change, is this. 720 Vincent Drive at the bottom here is the land. The LLC mentioned earlier, Always Lands and Grounds Association, owns the land. Athens Area Pagans rents the land from them. There are reasons for this. If you really want to know, we'll tell you. Um, Always is a project of Athens Area Pagans, and between the two of them, they support and manage the religious spaces. The Always members who live on site would own the residential housing, but not the land that it's on. We also envision non-member residents who would rent housing. There is no specific method yet for joining Always. We would love it if you're interested, if you would join our discussions. We are working these things out. And the reason we don't have a method is we're still working things out. <laughs> um, uh, one problem is that many grant opportunities specifically exclude religious organizations. There are ways around that. However, the always intentional community, the, the housing part really isn't religious in its nature. So we were thinking maybe that should be a separate nonprofit, but we're not sure yet. We don't know yet. We haven't decided if the resident owner should be part of the LLC. We also need to consider the other users of the religious spaces. They are indeed part of the intentional community, even if they don't necessarily live there. And we want to remain flexible at this early stage in the development. With that, we are happy to answer questions and I will copy this website address into the chat. Okay, let's stop here. Okay, thank you so much, Angela and Lachelle. That's, um, that was a great presentation. It's clear you've done an incredible amount of research and organizing to figure all that out. And it was clearly, it was very clearly presented. Um, so, so thank you. And thank you for sharing, because I think this information will be helpful for other intentional communities that are in a similar stage of development or, or getting, getting towards that. And I love how, you know, we heard from Jennifer earlier their community started in 1957, you know, so decades in the making and you're just, you know, you have your land, but now you're, you're figuring out all these other issues. I really like the design of your land too, with the, the circles where the houses are and the gardens in the middle. That was, that was sweet. We like that a lot too. It's, it's also practical. If you have people on both ends of the land, they can keep an eye on things without having to walk all the way to the other end. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and just the way it's set up and what is actually on there topographically, it also makes sense. So also zoning. Yes. Zoning. <laughs> yes. So many zoning issues. Oh, gosh. Sure. Wow. Wow. Well, it's impressive you made it thus far, you know. Um, so let's see. Um, folks who are listening, if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A box. We'd really love to hear your questions. I'm curious, how many members do you have in the organization or when you have been sending out those surveys, who, who, who do those surveys go to? Let's see, so organization-wise, uh, the LLC itself has seven members who have um, signed on and brought or are paying on the land, uh, but there are more members in the broader community who are not actually legally part of that LLC. So they are helping as they can. The surveys, I actually need to send out another round because our social media has actually grown since then, go out to our Facebook, our website. We do have our own website built, our um, mail mailing, it, mailing list. list. Um, and then we're, there are a number of local Facebook groups that are pagan centric that we are members of and we push that out to. So we are looking mostly in the North Georgia area, but also just, you know, the state and local area in general. Um, we've also presented with other Athens Pagan Pride Days or sent information their ways. So it's going out, I think, at a, a reasonable we had, distance. Um... For the most recent survey, or when I looked most recently, there were 55 responses. Mm -hmm. As far as people who are currently members of Athens area pagans, probably in the 40 to 50 range. I, I'm not the secretary, so I don't keep up with that exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Neither is she. Someone else's job. Uh, but, uh, you know, on um, typically we would have maybe a, a hundred or two people on a mailing list, but only say 
40 or 50 might actually be members, right? Yeah. And then you have the 10 who show up often. That's, that's the way it <laughs> yeah. is. Yeah. yeah, we have a set core who mostly show up to meetings and events and then other people who come in and out as they're available who live in the general area. And then it's Athens, Georgia is a university town. So we also have a transient population that comes in and out as they go through the university. So it's constantly fluctuating. Yeah, yeah. Well, what a great idea to do surveys and not only like build the engagement and the excitement with the people in your network, but also get some practical information from them. That's a great strategy. Oh, yes, because yeah. we do want to serve the community in the area with yeah. the resources that we're trying to create. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, great. Yeah. Are there other uh, pagan groups or networks in other towns and cities in the U.S. who may be also thinking about starting an intentional community maybe you could there are a number of communities um they tend to go out in the you know out in the boonies because <laughs> you can just get a lot of land for cheap and you can pretty much do what you want to and you don't have to, to worry too much about it um we made it hard on ourselves because we wanted people who don't have cars which is not a small percentage of our population and we wanted them to be able to get to the land we didn't want to go out so far that people had trouble getting out there or if they joined the community they would have trouble coming into Athens you know if they needed to so mm -hmm. um I don't know of I don't know of any that are in a city I don't know of any that are trying to be open to many different paths most of them are a specific religion so mm -hmm. um and, and and they will have their uh land or whatever for their religion mm -hmm. i think we're i'm sure someone else has done this but we haven't <laughs> found them any you know uh, yeah, yeah not, not nearby we have earth song which is not pagan specific it's very general mm -hmm. and spiritual which is just across the county boundaries mm -hmm. and she has uh, a community there that yeah. is there's some of things less housing more just general practice spaces and places for people to use for their businesses and it's it's a really nice place though uh, dragon hills is across almost next to alabama they're more of a event venue mm -hmm. um but they are way out there and yeah yeah and they're, they're not for housing or for individuals to just show up necessarily yeah right. so we, we want to be available for individuals and small groups to just pop in whenever they want yeah okay let's see mm -hmm. so yeah. this is unique in that you're focusing on residential housing that's nearby accessible for people without cars yeah that's great and, and not a specific religion we're just open to all paths you know any any um any of the religions there are many yeah because you know around here you're going to see churches on every street corner but for people who don't want to join in with that particular um way of life way of life belief system uh, or more nature-based there's not a lot of places for them to go and practice that's not you know someone's backyard as you can't exactly go start a bonfire in your public park right <laughs> or <laughs> you know hold a, a full moon ritual in the middle of the night in a park you can't you, yeah you know, they close at sundown right uh, yeah be chased ah. out yeah. yeah okay I see that makes a lot of sense why you would want a dedicated space yeah mm -hmm. okay well hey I'm wishing you a lot of luck in this process and you know encouragement even despite all those challenges that you're facing um, hopefully some people who, on this call who are listening now or watching the recording later might have some ideas for you or be able to offer some additional support um, but yeah seems like you're doing a great job and I am hopeful that you'll get to have your community there someday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay, great. So thank you, Angela and Michelle. And now we're going to go to Richard. Thank you, Richard, for your patience. And I'm really happy to have you here with us to talk about Bruderhof communities, because whenever I'm searching the directory on IC.org, Oh, very often I'm clicking on the map and then a Bruderhof community will come up. And so I'm sure other people have had this experience and might be curious to yeah, learn more about, about your network. Um, so big welcome to you and take it away. Thanks so much, Cynthia. And uh, thanks to my co-presenters. Fascinating to hear about 
uh, your community. Um, so just a bit about myself. Um, my name is Richard Mobson. I'm 40 years old. I'm married. I have five kids, ages four to 15, and I live at the Woodcrest Bruderhof in Rifton, New York, around with, um, with around 250 men, women, singles, young people. Um, I joined the Bruderhof almost 20 years ago um, because I felt and still do feel that living in this way, we can answer many of the problems that um, plague society at large. You know what, I'm gonna start my screen share here, if I may. And I'm just gonna give you a little fly through of, um, is that working? No. Oh, I haven't hit share yet, have I? All right, here we go. So uh, here's a little, hopefully, this is a fly through of the community where I live in Rifton, New York, and you can see the residential buildings. You can see um, the some of the office buildings, meeting spaces. Um, we like to meet outdoors a lot, um, so you'll see some of that. Hopefully, I don't know if it's still playing or not. It looks good. Looks good. Okay, here we go. All right. Um, yeah. So, like I said, I felt like, and still do feel like, this way of living can answer so many of the problems that plague our society. Uh, economic and social injustice, um, purpose, purposelessness in work, uh, violence, um, unsafe and toxic environments for raising children, uh, devaluation of the disabled and elderly, um, loneliness and isolation. I feel like not the Bruderhof as an organization. I mean, I think there's many ways to do this. There's many places to do this, but I think living in community um, is just a really great way to um, adjust, uh, um, address many of these problems. Um, so this video goes on for a little while, but I might just, um, so like I said, we meet a lot outside when we can. We love to be in nature. We feel like we can worship God the best when we're in the natural um, world. Um, and um, we have a school that's to the left there. You can't really see it through the trees. It's the K through eight school for that's where all the kids go who, who live here. That's where all my kids have gone. Um, we have an indoor meeting space in this building here. Um, that sort of mansion you see there that was originally here, um, built in the early 20th century. Sorry, yeah, 20th century. Um, and uh, anyway, rush to the place. So I'm just gonna advance and start talking about our history a bit. So um, our community was founded in Germany in 1920 um, by the Protestant theologian Eberhard Arnold, who's the guy lying down in the middle of the picture, um, uh, with his wife Emmy and her sisters Elsa von Lander. And they were seeking answers to the devastation of post-war society, post-World War I society, and they were frustrated by the silence of the established church in the face of widespread chaos. So um, they left Berlin, where he was a speaker, um, and they moved to the remote village of Zanerts. And there, inspired by the example of the first Christians in Jerusalem who shared all their possessions in common and lived together, they started a community with a small group. Um, in its first years, the Berdoff grew quickly to over 100 people. Um, they relied on farming and the sale of book, books from their publishing house um, known as Plow, which still exists today. Money was always scarce, in part because the community opened its doors to orphans um, to single mothers and others in need of assistance. But poverty became more acute after 1933 when the Nazis banned the sale of books and crafts by the community. So a farm was um, purchased in the Cotswolds in England in 1936. Um, this community was started as a sort of a mission outpost. There were a lot of people um, in England who were interested in community at that time, but it was also meant to be a refuge should Nazi persecution force the community to, to flee, which Indeed, it did. Um, in 1937, um, stormtroopers surrounded the community. Um, several members were imprisoned, and they gave the rest 48 hours to leave Germany. As a Gestapo official wrote in an internal memo, um, he wrote, the Bruderhof represents a worldview totally opposed to national socialism. This worldview included the refusal to salute Hitler, um, serve in the military, or accept uh, a Nazi school teacher in the Bruderhof school. So the expelled members managed to find their way to Liechtenstein and then to Holland and then to England where they joined their fellow community members at the Cotswold Bruderhof. Um, the members who had been arrested managed to escape and eventually made it to England as well. The new community grew rapidly to 350 uh, members over the next years. Many people had experienced the horrors of World War I and who wanted to totally 
um, dedicate their lives to a way of peace, came to visit and later joined the Bruderhof. Others heard about it from Bruderhof members who traveled throughout England to meet interested people, as well as through its publications, including the Plough magazine. Uh, with the outbreak of war in 1939, um, the mix of German refugees and English members aroused suspicion in the locality, resulting in a boycott of the community's farm. And by 1940, the English government had begun to implement a policy of forcible internment of enemy aliens. Actually, one of our members was interned, um, and the community soon found itself faced with a choice, either accept internment of all German nationals or leave the country as a group. Um, so they were committed to stay together, and um, they decided to seek refuge abroad. Um, the only country willing to accept a multinational group of pacifists in wartime was Paraguay in South America. So by the end of 1941, all members of the Bruderhof, except for three who remained in England, to sell the Cotswold property had safely relocated there and set out to build community in the jungle. Uh, life in Paraguay was difficult with a harsh and unfamiliar climate, tropical diseases, and limited access to the wider world. Over the next 20 years, however, um, three Paraguayan locations were established, as well as a hospital that served the community and tens of thousands of indigenous Paraguayans. After World War II, a wave of interest in communal living led um, dozens of young Americans to visit the Paraguayan communities. By the early 1950s, many had joined, and in 1954, Woodcrest, the first North American Bruderhof, which is where I live today, um, was founded. Um, it's in New York's Hudson Valley, about an hour and a half north of New York City. Uh, meanwhile, other communities had been founded in Europe as well, and um, by 1962, the Paraguayan communities had closed and members had emigrated to the United States and Europe. The community supported itself by making wooden toys for children, um, which were sold as community playthings, um, which is still in existence today. And later, uh, we started a business making equipment for uh, folks with disabilities. Since then, we've established more communities in the United States, as well as um, in the United Kingdom, Germany, Austria, Paraguay, Australia, and most recently in South Korea. And communities are rural, um, they're urban, they're big and small. So. Um, some key features of the Bruderhof um, were a Christian community um, following Jesus in obedience to his teachings, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount is central to our life together. Um, we share everything in common, um, both money and property. Um, no one owns anything individually. We have one common bank account across all our network of communities. Uh, membership in the Bruderhof is a lifelong commitment. Without this commitment, we believe there can be no true loyalty, which is essential in community life, particularly when hard times come, um, as anyone who lives in intentional community will know. <laughs> um, families are the basic unit of the Bruderhof community. Um, we're an educational community committed to providing children with a happy and constructive childhood. We want to educate the whole, the whole child, heart, head, and hand. Um, we run our own schools, kindergarten through eighth grade, and we also have our own accredited four-year high school. Um, our faith and daily work are inseparable. There are many different jobs within a Bruderhof community, um, school principals, uh, community laundry, um, gardener, uh, product designer, doctor, dentist, lawyer, uh, among others. Um, but crucially, none of these positions is considered higher or lower than the other. The work we do is not only an economic activity, but it's also a service we provide for each other and our neighbors. Um, Christian discipleship demands we put love of God and love of neighbor into practice. Um, the Bruderhof strives for a life dedicated to service, doing the works of mercy demanded by Christ, giving food to the hungry and water to the thirsty, um, welcoming the stranger, clothing the naked, giving alms to the poor, and visiting the, fit, the sick and those in prison. Um, we stand with the mistreated, the voiceless, and the oppressed, and our outreach takes many forms. Um, in seeking to fulfill Christ's calling, we work with others of goodwill, regardless of their faith or affiliation. We support the works of global nonprofits addressing acute crises, and we also work side by side with local neighbors to support food banks, uh, tutor children, or visit with senior citizens. So to the membership process, um, a person enters into membership in stages. Um, guests are welcome among us at the community's discretion, regardless of whether they are interested in membership. 
Um, we have what we call the resident volunteer program where you can come and live and work with us for two to four weeks. Um, those wishing to remain longer can request to stay on as novices. If the community agrees and the person concerned is 18 years of age or older, he may be accepted for um, the novitiate, which is a time of discernment and testing. Um, novices who have become certain of their calling and have received um, believer's baptism and are 21 or older may declare um, to the community their request to take lifelong vows of membership. Um, before taking vows, candidates must settle all their worldly affairs, must give away all their property and settle all prior commitments. And if the community discerns it's the right thing, um, the candidate will be received into membership. Um, membership vows are taken at a celebratory meeting of the church community um, where the vows are, are publicly professed. So this is our community in Harlem, uh, New York. And um, that's my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Richard. That was a very rich presentation. I loved learning about the long history of the Bruderhof. And I, I really didn't know. I didn't know about the persecution in, in Germany and then needing to leave the UK and the Pura Paraguay and all of that history. I can only imagine how those experiences really bonded that early group and are probably deeply embedded in your, your culture as a community, would you say? Yeah, absolutely. Um, our history, you know, definitely has, we've been through many ups and downs over the years, um, you know, many times of difficulty internally and externally. And uh, we look back on those experiences and try to draw wisdom um, for challenges that we face today, so. Yeah, yeah, incredible, wow. All right, well, for everyone listening, encouraging you to ask your questions, uh, put them in the Q&A box if you can. Um, yeah, I'm curious, Richard, if you don't mind my asking, do, did you, were you born into Bruderhof or did you take the vows later in life? Yeah, so I was born into the Bruderhof, but um, membership is not like a birthright at all. Um, I left the community for several years, um, you know, tried different things. I lived in Haiti, um, working at a, a hospital. Um, for a time and, you know, and young, young folks who are, grow up in the Bruderhof are encouraged to really, you know, go out and, and, you know, find out what other people do, how other people live. And if they feel like they're called to a different life, a different way of, of service, um, they're free to do that. And we want to support them in that. Nice. Okay. Thank you. I understand. Uh, and then when, when you're part of the community, um, yeah, this, this was really interesting for me to learn about, you know, giving up your private property and joining. And so when you join, do, are you, how do you um, choose the job that you have or apply or are you assigned or how, how does that work? Because it seems like you have multiple businesses, multiple yeah. job opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so the vows we take are basic monastic vows of poverty, um, chastity and obedience you know, and obedience applies to where you work. Um, I was trained as a nurse. I currently work as um, an archivist and records manager. I produce videos, I produce um, a podcast. Um, so, and I also work in the, in the factory uh, making, making equipment. So, um, you know, you'll have people who are lawyers who work in the laundry, you know. Um, wow. You'll have nurses who are taking care of, you know, um, children's groups. Um, so there's just a lot of flexibility, which is what I think makes it fun. Like uh, our vocation is a life and community. We don't have careers um, and, um, you know, it makes life really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say, wow. And I can imagine because it seems like many of your communities are, are sizable enough that you can have your own internal econ economy in a way where you can, you know, there's enough, um, enough of a, a base of people to actually have jobs and sell goods and services. Do, do, are there relationships between the Bruderhof communities, um, either economic exchange or are there big gatherings? Yeah, I mean, we're one, we consider ourselves one community, regardless of location, all, all our finances are shared um, between I don't know how many locations, so 30 locations, all the money goes into one, um, one bank account and it's available for use by 
So we have communities that are building up. Um, we have a new community in South Korea where they're just establishing themselves. That property was purchased um, you know, with finances from all the rest of us and we're supporting them until they can get on their feet. Okay, great, great. And, uh, and I just seen a message here in the chat. Um, uh, for folks who want to know about the various Bruderhof community listings, they are in the Intentional Communities directory. And also on the Bruderhof website, you have a list, I've noticed, of the yeah. different countries. Yeah, if you want to see where we're located, um, you can, you can um, check it out there. And we definitely, like, we're very open to folks visiting us. If you just want to drop in for a meal um, or if you want to volunteer for a longer stretch or whatever, um, or even just get in touch virtually. Uh, we really love getting to know other people. Um, we do not recruit. Um, we believe like you can't really live in a community unless you really are happy about doing it. Um, so um, yeah. yeah, so don't yeah. feel threatened. Don't feel threatened by the life commitment because no one's gonna make you take it. <laughs> okay, okay, good. Good to know, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> uh, all right, Aaron has a question. How are the communities led? That's one question. And then is external arboration ever needed? Courts, et cetera. I guess, I guess asking about your conflict resolution process. Yeah, I mean, so we have like the, the biblical conflict resolution. Um, so if, if we have a problem with someone, we need to go to them directly, um, try to work it out directly. If we can't, um, we bring in somebody else to try to mediate. Uh, and if there's still a problem, we'll bring it to like the body of the body of the, the membership body. and. Um, that generally solves problems. Um, and I mean, like I said, we don't want anyone here who doesn't wanna be here. So even if people are committed members and they decide to, they wanna go, um, you know, not holding anybody. Gotcha, gotcha. And then do you have um, like a decision-making process as community when, when things come up that need to be decided? Yeah, so I mean, like you can't, you can't involve everybody in everything. So, you know, we, we ask certain people to um, be responsible for different areas, you know, financial, um, you know, legal governance, things of that nature. And, and, and they, they're, in, we give them sort of authority to, to make smaller decisions um, by themselves. We trust them to do that and that they're going to do it well. Um, larger decisions are brought before the membership body and we have a chance to discuss them. We believe in uh, unanimity. Um, when it comes to um, decision making. So as much as that's possible, um, you know, even if one person has a problem with something, um, we'll take time to listen to them and try to address whatever concerns they might have. Okay. Okay, great. Seems to make sense. Uh, and then Amory has some questions. Um, first question, how is the spiritual life organized? I'm imagining, you know, are there regular services or? Yeah, so, I mean, we kind of see our life as a whole. So like our work is part of our spiritual life. We work together and that's just a really important way to put our, what, say what, what we believe into action by working hard and diligently and uh, getting along in the workspace. Um, we also eat together every day. So the common table is an important part of our worship, I guess, you know, sharing food together. Um, we do meet together for, you know, either to discuss issues or to, you know, um, read from uh, the Bible or other texts that inspire us. Um, those meetings can be led by pretty much anyone, um, whoever wants to, <laughs> or whoever gets asked to. Um, but we're not like a, a Sunday church at all. Our, our Sunday meeting is like with the kids, goes on for about half an hour. Um, we just sing some songs to them, you know, could just sing like songs that they're singing in, in school about nature or whatever. And we read a story, read a Bible story. Um, and it's pretty simple. We try to have a pretty simple approach. We're pretty, I guess some people would call it low church. No, I see. I see. Yeah. Okay. Wow. I love, I love, thank you for sharing. I think, you know, you, you have certain projections maybe about what some of these communities are like and especially Bruderhof and I just I appreciate how you're presenting it in a yeah simple I mean, just way to, just to uh the, the the common thing people think about us is we're a cult right um and I totally get that I understand why people think that um the only way you could um disprove that to yourself is just come say hi to us and um 
you'll realize that people are actually mostly pretty happy. Um, not everyone agrees with each other with each other about everything. We argue a lot. Um, you know, we really try to maintain like honesty and equality in our relationships to each other. And um, so just putting that out there. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, one last question, Emery. Uh, can single people participate for life? Can Absolutely. Yeah. We have many single members and they're, they're greatly valued, um, you know, members of our community. Um, we try to incorporate them in, in, you know, our family life, like our, my family, um, we've often had a single who's not related to us as part of our family. They can participate with us as much as they like. Um, our house is open to them at any time. Um, they join us for, you know, family meals and such. So yeah, absolutely. Um, married, single, old. Um, we value our older members very much. Um, especially those who've, who've been in the community for a long time. They have a lot of wisdom um, and yeah. Yeah, yeah, great. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Yeah, wonderful. Ah, all right, so we are now gonna enter into the last little bit of our time together. So I actually wanna invite all of our presenters, if you wouldn't mind to turn on your videos. And, uh, and yeah, I want to have just some general discussion to wrap things up. Um, for everyone who's listening, if you have a question in mind or a comment that you'd like to share with everyone, um, feel free to put that in the chat or the Q&A box. I also really love it if to, to hear other voices. So if you know how to use the raise your hand tool, um, that should be either a raise your hand button, it might be under reactions. Um, go ahead attendees, if you have a question or a comment, um, just to go ahead and raise your hand and we'll call on you to speak. Ah, and, uh, and yeah, and I'd like to open it up to our presenters too. I mean, just, um, I think just first in an acknowledgement of, uh, maybe the, hmm, how to say, normalizing, maybe, I don't know if that's a good word, of, of some of these spiritual and religious communities. And I think there is, you know, some, as Richard named, people think that we're a cult, you know, there's some obvious stereotypes about this particular form of intentional communities, although I think all communities, even the, my own community, deal with it to a certain degree. So just an acknowledgement and appreciation for you being here and sharing with us. And that said, I wonder, how do you handle those projections, I guess, or the difficult questions about your community? Uh, is it easy for you? Is it awkward? You know, what advice do you have for other communities that are also spiritual or religious communities? Um, feel free just to unmute and whoever wants to share first, Ken. Oh, I'll just say uh, first, no, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, um, Athens Area Pagans actually does a lot of outreach events. Uh, yearly, we do the Athens Pagan Pride Day, which is about going out. Uh, we actually are in downtown having like a street festival with a bunch of artists and vendors and whatnot who might be interested in, you know, might be selling things interesting to the pagan community. And we get a lot of people going out. It's like, oh, what's a pagan? So we get to uh, describe that. And I actually had a conversation with a coworker of mine who said that the only thing she'd ever heard about pagans was horror movies and the satanic panic from the 70s and the 80s. And she's like, I really thought y'all worshipped the devil. And I was like, no, no, that, that's really not it. Or very much about um, looking at our place in nature and our, you know, place in the environment and, um, you know, honoring life and life cycles and all sorts of things. So we do get protesters. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but usually they're well enough behaved. So it's, it's okay. Yeah, we, we got our first real yeah. protesters this last year at Athens Bacon Pride Day, walking back and forth with cameras and trying, signs and signs <laughs> and you know trying to get people to engage, and we're just like ignore them. So we ignored ignore the protesters and have conversations with people who are generally gen genuinely interested in talking. Yeah. Yeah, good strategy. Just ignore them. 
uh, yeah, legally they are allowed to be in public spaces, so we can't push them out. So. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree with what you're saying there. Um, most importantly, get out in the area, um, help your neighbors out, um, mm -hmm. you know, show that you care for others beyond your community and don't be defensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because mm -hmm. that just gives the wrong impression. Yeah. Yes, we're a somewhat different situation here in that we um, open our space up to public events and to, I mean, it seems like maybe some of the others do too, but because we're in downtown Boston and because we do that, we're a site of like the Boston Early Music Festival and we participate in the Beacon Hill Civic Association's Hill Fest and we have community groups using our space that more often I think folks um, understand us as kind of a community center. We call ourselves the center for community. Um, then, uh, but you know, there are always jokes with our residents. We're like hashtag not a cult, um, and so we're a commune, um, and so um, even within our own within Quakerism, um, there's a publication, French Journal, that we have an article in. So I think it's okay. But they were they were doing an is an issue called Quaker Utopias and named us as a project toward Quaker Utopia. And we're like, oh well, <laughs> that doesn't really do a whole lot for our not hashtag not a cult. Um, <laughs> uh, we're not trying to create a utopia here, and that's sort of the purpose of our article in that. Um, journal um, issue is that um, we're really working to try to build community and think about um, not how to be the perfect thing, but how to be um, really good at working on being imperfect. <laughs> um, and that's a really different kind of project for us. Mm -hmm. um, and so also Quakerism in general has a um, you know different kind of societal understanding. Either folks know us as um, people who are involved in um, abolition or were involved um, in the civil rights movement, but, um, or they don't think that we exist anymore and get us confused with shakers, um, which we are not. <laughs> and so, I don't know, those are some of the things that end up coming up for us. Great, good. That's interesting to hear all of your various experiences. Beautiful. Okay, well, we are coming towards the end of our time together. So I just want to put into the chat because I know um, some of our, our guests, uh, uh, audience members are going to be leaving soon. So I'm just going to put into the chat about how you can find out about upcoming events. Um, we try to post the upcoming communities about one month in advance, and those will all be on the IC.org uh, webpage, IC.org slash events. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, this event is now being hosted in partnership with Community Finder, so I'll put that link into the chat as well. And always, if you have a community in mind, that you would really like us to bring onto the program, um, just, just let us know, send us a message. Uh, if you have a community that you want to have presented, we also have a presenter form that you can find on ic.org. All right, so having said all that, um, I wanna come into one last question for you all. And I think, well, you all touched on it, but I think especially Richard in your presentation, you touched on it that like, before I get into the details of my community, I just really want to acknowledge that community living is so special and can be a way to address all of these societal problems, you know, isolation and loneliness and the environmental problems, et cetera, et cetera. So I wonder if you could share for us, because uh, this is a call where we have people watching who are maybe new to intentional community living, and you've done a great job at about sharing the specifics of each of your communities. But I wonder if you could share just more broadly why community living is important, you know, what it means to live in community at this time, why somebody might want to consider this lifestyle. Uh, yeah, anything that comes to mind uh, for you to share, go ahead and unmute. Deep question, I know. <laughs> Well, I think I think just societally we're seeing like the, the the damage caused by like unbridled individualism and people wanting things my way. Um, it's damaged the environment. It's damaged people's mental health. Um, you know the rise in depression among young people. Um, and to me, like we're meant to live together, right? 
you know, not in a specific community, but we're meant to live cooperatively. We're meant to put the common good above, you know, our own individual good. Um, and I think that's something people in the past have reacted against. Um, you know, they want it their way. Um, but then you realize, you know, we got a short time on this earth. Um, we actually have even a shorter time when we can be really productive. When we're kids, we're dependent. When we're old, we're dependent. Um, so, you know, it'd be smarter if we would try to find ways to live together and support each other. Yeah, smarter, just makes sense. Totally. It does, it's practical, right? Because yes. you can't do everything. It, it, individualism is, it's a nice idea, but you, you're not an individual. You have to go buy groceries. You have to, you know, <laughs> you, you can, when you're in a community, you can help each other. That was one of the big draws for us was, I don't have to go across town to feed Angela's cats. I can walk down this, <laughs> this street, right? And I, you know, that that was really appealing to all of us too, when we were first talking about this, just being able to be together, help each other, you know? Yeah, and even without, you know, housing specifically together, we still do help each other out when we have issues or we're there, you know, for, you know, socially. And, you know, like recently I lent another member a car when his got totaled because we were a two-car family. So it's, it's just, it's a lot easier when you have other people to rely on. Yeah. Yeah. And more meaningful when people rely on you too. That too. Yeah. 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 Life is hard enough as it is. Why why make it more difficult by being so isolated? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. A good um a Quaker phrase to use here is friend the, these friends speak my mind, which is <laughs> um, you know, I, I share in a lot of what folks um named here. And I think that um you know, human beings are designed for connection. And I think part of how we understand ourselves and our place in the world and make meaning in it is through our connections with other people. And I think at the friend's house, one of the beauties in our communities that you're, you're gonna interact with a lot of people. I've lived, because of our four-year housing maximum, I, I've lived with like, I don't know, 60 people in the last five and a half years <laughs> of being here. And so all of those people help, like as um, I'm learning in Quakers and we talk about like that of God in every person. And we say that maybe even if folks don't believe in God, but <laughs> they're like that, that light within each person is unique. And like, as I watch and get to learn from other, another person's light, I get to learn more about my own and maybe different dimensions of my own light that I didn't know or wouldn't weren't brought out before because the circumstances weren't right. And so I think in those connections is how we learn about ourselves and our place in the world. And if you believe in God, maybe what God's calling you to do in the world in this moment. Um, I think community living really gives us an opportunity to, to be in relationship with people in that, in that way. And those relationships are not perfect and they are messy and there's conflict. And part of that conflict is also learning how to bring out um, different pieces of the light that, that you have in you. Um, and uh yeah, so I think community living is a great opportunity to to learn more about about yourself and about meaning in the world. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. These friends speak my mind. I'm going to use this. <laughs> great. Uh, all right. Well, thank you all so much for sharing. Thank you for your time, taking the time to be here. Thank you for the work that you're doing in the world. In your in your various communities, um, yeah, just just really appreciate it, and thank you for everyone for your listening and good questions. I hope to see you again next month. <sighs> All right, take care, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye.